Aloha, my name is Stephanie Nagami, and on behalf of the Pacific Bridge Companies and our Ohana, we are delighted to serve as Patriot sponsors for today's Go For Broke Monument anniversary. We are honored and proud to pay tribute to our Nisei World War II soldiers, and we give thanks for their courage, patriotism, and sacrifice. We also look forward to working with the Go For Broke National Education Center in sharing their story to new audiences around the globe. Mahalo nui loa for your continued support of the Go For Broke National Education Center, and we hope you enjoy today's program.
Hello from Phoenix, Arizona. My name is Mano Kawahara, and I served in the 100-442nd Regimental Combat Team. Welcome to the monument anniversary. I'm Ben Suechika from Torrance, California. I served in the Military Intelligence Service. Welcome to the monument anniversary. I am Iwao Yonimitsu from Nalegu, Hawaii. I served in L Company in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Welcome to the Go For Broke Monument Anniversary. I'm Yosh Nakamura, and I served in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team during World War II. Thank you for your support and watching today. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm David Ono, ABC7 News anchor and member of Go For Broke National Education Center's Board of Directors. I'm sure you agree that there is no better way to start our 23rd Go For Broke Monument Anniversary Virtual Tribute than with our veterans. We want to say thank you for sending in their wonderful welcome messages. I am fortunate to participate in many events in Southern California, but this event is one that I always look forward to each year. And while we again are cautious due to the pandemic, the purpose and message of our monument anniversary tribute has only been strengthened. Unfortunately, our nation continues to struggle with the issues surrounding racial intolerance, civil liberties, and social justice, not much unlike what the Nisei generation experienced during World War II. To begin today, let me introduce a beautiful rendition of the national anthem by Kendall Yokoyama, whose grandfather, Mike Yoshio Kubota, served in the MIS, and her great uncle, Sadaichi Kubota, was in the 100th 442nd. So proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the It is so moving to hear this patriotic song with the faces of our Nisei veterans. Today, we honor and pay tribute to the 33,000 young Japanese American men and women who were willing to serve their country at all costs. Their actions were from a purely selfless and courageous sense of obligation so that future generations would not have their loyalty questioned nor their civil liberties unjustly taken away. I volunteered from a relocation center to show my loyalty and to prove that I had the right to live as a good American citizen. It is now my pleasure to introduce my co-host, Mitch Maki, President and CEO of Go For Broke National Education Center. Mitch. Hello and welcome everyone. David, 
It is so wonderful to be here with you again on our 23rd Monument Anniversary. I am equally excited because this weekend is the reopening of our Defining Courage exhibition, which explores the concept of courage through the lives of young Japanese Americans of World War II, and asks contemporary visitors to act with similar courage in their own lives. We are also proud to present within the exhibition a new display featuring the Medal of Honor, Distinguished Service Cross, and Bronze Star Medals of Private First Class Ryo Jo Hayashi from the 100th 442nd. Ryo Hayashi was born on August 14, 1920, in the agricultural community of Salinas, California. He took on the name Jo Hayashi from an early age. Shortly after Joe's birth, his father was electrocuted in a farming accident. His mother, two sisters, and Joe moved to Pasadena, California, where his mother remarried. Friendly and outgoing, Joe was athletic, played football and baseball, was a Boy Scout, and practiced kendo. He also loved the outdoors, fishing and quail hunting in particular. He raised pigeons, fixed cars, and even bottled his own root beer. Often he could be found hanging out with friends, which included Max Robinson, the brother of Jackie Robinson. Once he graduated from John Muir Tech High School, Joe found a job as an auto mechanic. He then enlisted in the Army in May 1941, just before the U.S. was to enter World War II. December 7, 1941, Imperial Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, thereby thrusting the United States into the Pacific theater of World War II. Within the next six months, the U.S. government forcibly removed 112,000 individuals of Japanese ancestry living on the west coast of the United States, two-thirds of whom were U.S. citizens. Initially, they went to assembly centers located in racetracks and fairgrounds, and then on to incarceration camps in the interior. The West Coast Japanese American community lived behind barbed wire for the next three to five years. Joe's family was among them, and for the duration of the war, lived at the Heart Mountain concentration camp near Cody, Wyoming. When Joe enlisted in the Army in May 1941, he trained at the Presidio and Fort Sheridan before heading to Camp Shelby in Mississippi to join the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Joe engaged in some of the fiercest battles that the 100th 442nd experienced in their baptism under fire. He also fought in the breaking of the Gothic Line in Italy. Late April 1945, the army broke the Gothic Line, the Nazis' last line of defense in Italy, and aggressively pursued them northward. April 20th, Joe led an attack against a strongly defended hill near the village of Tendola. After being detected by the enemy, Joe dragged his wounded comrades to safety then returned alone. He exposed himself to small arms fire to reveal the enemy's location. He directed and adjusted mortar fire against the enemy's emplacements. Joe boldly led his surviving men up the hill and neutralized the last of the Nazi machine gun nests. Two days later, Joe led his squad in an attack at Tendola. Under intense fire and using hand grenades, he destroyed two machine gun nests and forced those who were not killed to surrender or flee. And Joe didn't stop there. He pursued the fleeing Nazis and was killed by a burst of pistol fire. Joe Hayashi died fighting for his country, the United States of America. He fought for liberty and for justice halfway across the world even while his own family remained imprisoned behind barbed wire, incarcerated in a camp where, only four months earlier, his stepfather died of cancer. In August 1945, the Army awarded Joe Hayashi the Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest medal that the Army awards. However, Actions similar to Joe's oftentimes resulted in the awarding of the highest commendation, the Medal of Honor. 
50 years after the end of the war, a federal bill passed which directed the Department of Defense to review the records of World War II Asian American soldiers who had been awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Among these soldiers was Joe. Upon their review, the Department of Defense upgraded the award bestowed upon Joe Hayashi in 1945 to the Medal of Honor. On June 21, 2000, President Bill Clinton presided over the ceremony at the White House, awarding our nation's highest military recognition for acts of valor to 22 Asian American World War II veterans, 15 of them posthumously. When young Japanese American men volunteered enthusiastically, some Americans were puzzled. But those who volunteered knew why. Their own country had dared to, dared to question their patriotism, and they would not rest until they had proved their loyalty. As sons set off to war, so many mothers and fathers told them, live if you can, die if you must but fight always with honor and never ever bring shame on your family or your country. Rarely has a nation been so well served by a people it had so ill treated. By the end of the war, America's military leaders in Europe all wanted these men under their command. Their motto was go for broke. They risked it all to win it all. They created a custom of reverse AWOL. Wounded soldiers left their hospital beds against doctor's orders to return to battle. Chie Watanabe accepted the Medal of Honor on behalf of her brother. Courage, patriotism, sacrifice. These words describe the service of the Japanese American veterans of World War II. These words describe the service of Ryojo Hayashi. He fought more than just the enemy. He fought for the future of those he loved and those he would never know. Okage sama de. Because of him, we are. A couple of years before Chie passed away, she gave her son Robert the framed Medal of Honor, the Distinguished Service Cross and Bronze Star, which she had proudly displayed in her living room. Recently, Robert decided he wanted to share the story of his Uncle Joe through his medals and considered several places meaningful to his uncle's life, eventually entrusting Go For Broke National Education Center with the care of Joe's medals and, more importantly, his legacy. Go For Broke National Education Center is honored to be the home of Joe Hayashi's story of courage and obligation to others. His Medal of Honor Distinguished Service Cross and Bronze Star will be on permanent display. A testament to the future that was created by acts of courage, patriotism, and sacrifice. I want to give a special thank you to the Watanabe and Nakawatase family for allowing us to share Joe's story and his medals. Be sure to check out our website for visitor information. In thinking about the remarkable accomplishments of the Nisei soldier, it is easy to immortalize them. The reality is that these were ordinary individuals in extraordinary times who felt the responsibility for not just themselves, but for an entire nation. A popular feature of Monument Anniversary is the Honor of Veteran Digital Tributes, which was aired during the pre-show. It is very touching to see the veterans' photos proudly submitted by family and friends eager to highlight their personal stories. In the coming weeks, we will post the digital tributes on our social media, but you can also watch the pre-show again after today's broadcast on our YouTube and Facebook channels. Others also purchased veteran floral tributes which have been placed around the monument today. And we thank our tribute donors for their support and to San Gabriel Nursery and Southern California Flower Market for their generous donations of the potted plants and wreaths. Let me now introduce George Henning, President and CEO of Pacific Global Investment Management Company and Board Chair of Go For Broke National Education Center. Certainly George and the Board have been key to the continued growth and success of our organization, in particular during the past two years. On behalf of the Board of Directors, Governors and Circle of Ambassadors, 
I thank you for joining us today. 2022 promises to be another exciting and busy year as we remain focused on broadening the Nisei veteran story as an important American story. I also want to thank all of our generous sponsors and supporters who share our commitment to our mission and our work. Please enjoy today's program. Thank you, George, for your message and for your leadership. As we all have experienced, a virtual platform brings thousands together at the same time and from across the nation. We are grateful for all of you who are watching this live broadcast today. On our Facebook and YouTube channels, please chat with us. It is always interesting to see who is watching and from where. Plus, tell us how you carry on the legacy of our Nisei World War II veterans. 33 years ago, a group of Nisei veterans wanted to make sure that their stories of courage, patriotism, and sacrifice were not forgotten. More important, they felt the responsibility to maintain the legacy of their fellow soldiers who did not come home. On June 5, 1999, the Gopher Broke Monument was presented to the city of Los Angeles in downtown LA's historic Little Tokyo District. For those who have not visited the monument in person, the striking black granite contains the names of over 16,000 Nisei soldiers and their officers who served overseas in World War II. Carved above the names are 60 U.S. Army patches from the units under which the Nisei soldiers served. Prominently figured on the sloped face of the monument is an inscription of the words of Ben Tamashiro, a veteran of the 100th Infantry Battalion. It appears below the Nisei soldier's signature battle cry, Go for Broke, and the insignias of the 100th Infantry Battalion, 442nd Regimental Combat Team, Military Intelligence Service, 522nd Field Artillery Battalion, 232nd Combat Engineer Company, and the 1399 Engineer Construction Battalion. Quotes from President Harry S. Truman, President Ronald Reagan, General Douglas MacArthur, and Major General Charles A. Willoughby appear below the main inscription. And Mitch, many may not realize that the sloping granite face represents the hilly and thickly forested terrain of the Vosges Mountains in France, where many of the Nisei soldiers charged and overcame them. The granite rise also symbolizes the uphill struggle the Nisei soldiers made to prove their loyalty, which was challenged after the 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor. In front of the sloping granite is a replica of the 442nd shoulder sleeve insignia featuring the Torch of Liberty. Its flame burns in remembrance of those lost in battle. The monument stands as a permanent reminder of what can happen when, in times of war, the laws fall silent and why it is all of our responsibility to protect the liberties and freedoms for generations to come. On our website, goforbroke.org, you'll find more information about the monument, including the monument name search locator. You know, in about three years from now, the monument will no longer be sitting alone in a parking lot. The First Street North Expansion Project will create a much more engaging environment around our monument and an enhanced Little Tokyo community footprint. A footprint which had been drastically reduced in the decades after the war. With our partner, Little Tokyo Service Center, we anticipate breaking ground by this time next year, in mid-2023, and having construction completed in 2025. The project, financed through tax credits and commercial investment, includes approximately 30,000 square feet of commercial space with anchor tenants such as East West Players and other legacy businesses. Go For Broke National Education Center will have around 10,000 square feet of space for our offices, an exhibition hall, and a multi-purpose room. The project also includes over 240 affordable housing units for qualified individuals and families. 
It is amazing how swiftly this project has moved since even last year. Of course, we are ever grateful to Colonel Young O Kim, Mas Takahashi, Ken Akune, James Ogawa, Buddy Mamiya, Victor Abe, Tets Asato, and many others for establishing this solemn place where visitors can come, learn, and reflect on an important part of our history. The monument is at the heart of the First Street North Project. It is a significant step forward for our organization, the surroundings of the monument, and as a lasting reminder of our Nisei veterans. I must also acknowledge the support from the Little Tokyo business and community leaders and the Los Angeles City Council, in particular, Council Member Kevin DeLeon and his staff, Warren Furatani, Peter Brown, and Nate Hayward. I next have the honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Sila Masaki, the grandchild of Tomoki Masaki of the 100th Infantry 442nd. I was fortunate enough to meet Sila when I spoke this past February at Ledoux High School in St. Louis, Missouri. I was blown away by Sila's enthusiasm and eagerness to not only learn more about the Nisei soldier's story, but also to share it with those who knew nothing about this part of American history. It is my privilege to introduce Sila Masaki. 80 years ago, in 1942, my grandfather was 17 with a gun in his hand. 80 years later, in 2022, I too am 17 and am fortunate enough to be holding a pencil in my hand. We all fight our own battles. My grandfather fought his in Europe during World War II. I fight mine in school and beyond, striving to educate myself and others so that we can live in a world where we can resort to pens instead of weapons, words instead of swords. Hi. My name is Silo Masaki. I am Gosei, and I live with my family in St. Louis, Missouri. In addition to being Japanese American, I am Jewish, queer, and a big fan of Batman cartoons. I have been given the honor of speaking to you all today about my grandfather, who served in the 100th Infantry Battalion and the impact of his legacy on my life. My grandpa, Tomoki Masaki, was boarding at Mid-Pacific Institute in Honolulu when he and his classmates heard sirens. At first, they thought nothing of it, for they were used to hearing drill sirens from Pearl Harbor nearby. However, after climbing out the window and onto the roof, Grandpa and his classmates saw the planes pull up over the school. And on the underside of the wings, they saw a big red circle. And it was at that moment that they knew that this was not a drill. This was war. The next day, Grandpa went and enlisted, even though he was only 17. He would go on to fight in Italy and France with the 100th. I know that story like the back of my hand. That's how many times I've heard and retold it. But I never got to meet the man himself. He died when I was a young child. And he never really talked about the war with my dad. I'll never know what grandpa's own reasoning was for enlisting. All I know, all I have are these distant memories of a person who stands alone on a pillar of history. That's all I used to see him as, really. This distant family member who gave me a cool story to tell. Nothing else. Nothing more. Lately, however, I've been thinking about my relationship with my grandfather and how the parallels of our lives converge. Who was he? What did he stand for? Why did he fight for a country that imprisoned his own people? What was his truth? And how did he live it? Well, Dad says that Grandpa and I share an intergenerational stubbornness. When he and I set our minds to something, it'll probably take the end of the world to change our minds. Grandpa set his mind to serving his country and standing by his people. Even in the face of terrible racism and fear, still, Grandpa stood by his Japanese-American identity. In the middle of nowhere, Missouri, the majority white population doesn't typically understand my multicultural and multidimensional background. Speaking about my identities is an active choice I've made in order to celebrate that part of myself, that part of my truth. As many of you know, high school can suck. There have been many times when I have been bullied for being Japanese-American for being Jewish, and for being queer. On those days, I come home and I ask my parents or my sibling for a hug. And sometimes, I cry. Because it is so unbelievably hard to be loud and proud me every day. 
I mean, just this past week, several people decided to make me their punching bag and talked smack about me behind my back. In this situation, I have two choices. Say something or walk away. I made my choice. I spoke up to them for myself and confronted their fear. Grandpa made his choice. He voluntarily enlisted, even though he didn't have to or was expected to. When faced with a challenge, both Grandpa and I decide to meet it head on. Another part of my truth is working against misinformation. As a practicing Reformed Jew, I and other Jewish teens go to local Christian schools and educate others about Jewish practices and beliefs. We do this in order to create bridges between communities and in order to combat fear and anti-Semitism. Because we as Jews need police protection in our sacred spaces so that we can worship safely, this cross-community youth work is vital now more than ever. When I do this work, I celebrate another part of myself, another part of my heritage that allows me to live my truth with purpose. In St. Louis, there are very few Japanese Americans, mostly older Japanese or Japanese nationals. I'm so used to being culturally alone that I don't know how I'm supposed to be Japanese American. There's no mold to follow, no example to look at. And yes, I know there's no right way to be Japanese American, but it's hard when you're seen as the token JA and you already don't feel like you belong. When Go For Broke National Education Center came to my high school, suddenly I wasn't alone in my Japanese American experience. I was able to speak to my class about Grandpa in the 100th 442nd, giving me the opportunity to show that history is not in the distant black and white past that we tend to dismiss it as. And since then, I've been working with Go For Broke and speaking about my experience as a Japanese American. And it's changed my life. I've been using my voice, as I am right now, to speak my truth. Grandpa opened a door for me. Now, I know what it's like to be part of a Japanese American community and I've never felt more at home. Today, we honor the monument that bears the names of the Japanese Americans who served during World War II. My family didn't even know that there was a monument until I found the name locator on Gopher Broke's website. And sure enough, there was Grandpa, panel 3A, row 39. When I ran to show my dad, he began to cry. Today, we celebrate all the people, like Grandpa, who, in a moment of national and international strife, stayed true to who they were. They are an example and inspiration, not only to Japanese Americans, but to all of us. When I live like my truest self, I feel the most like Grandpa. When I stand by who I am, I honor my ancestors who came before me. I honor Grandpa, who refused to sit idly by when his truth was called into question. I stay resilient in the face of adversity and discrimination, just like he did. I learned all of these lessons from a man whom I never met, and yet he still lives on in me in the things that I do and advocate for. Okage sama de. Because of Grandpa, I can stand on my own pillar in the place of history. Because of Grandpa, after 80 years, I can live my truth. What an impressive and eloquent speaker Sila is. And folks, Sheila is 17 years old. Very inspirational and hopeful. Thank you for being part of this year's program. Well, when I think back to the first virtual tribute in 2020, our organization has been challenged in so many ways, but we also have come out of the pandemic more determined to position the story of the Nisei soldier as one that all Americans need to know. You know, David, I know that you carry on the legacy of our Nisei soldiers. So share with us, what have you been up to lately? I've been, remember, thanks to you, you asked me to be the keynote to Evening of Aloha back in 2019. Georgia Hill. I climbed it with my guide, Davide del Guadice. To actually walk this very ground is indescribable. And you can see its strategic value. The 100th made their way up. Some men did fall quietly so as to not give their brothers away. And they waited for dawn to break. And when it did, they moved in like lightning, taking Germans by complete surprise. The enemy either died, they ran, 
or they surrendered. I was scared to death, but I'm happy we did it because we, we put this speech together where I brought people to both uh, the Rescue of the Lost Battalion and the Gothic Line. I put it to some live music. And I came to realize there's, there's a, a thirst for people to see more and to experience more of the, what the Nisei soldier went through during the war. I've gone to Monte Cassino, to San Terenzo, to uh, Munich, where the death march was liberated by the 522nd. And I'm trying to get a better understanding of just geographically and physically the incredible accomplishments of the Nisei soldier. And I'm putting it together again as a speech with the live music again, the same choir, and we're trying to make it this emotional immersion into a better understanding of how incredible of soldiers these heroes were. So we have a performance coming up, July 29th, 7 p.m. in the Aratani Theater, and I'd like to open it up to your audience. All you have to do is contact Go For Broke, and we hope that all of you will be able to join us at the Aratani Theater when this performance occurs and see the wonderful production that you put together. You could tell people details and facts all they want. They have to feel the story. And this is our way to try to get them to feel the emotion of what the Nisei went through in that time. Folks, this is really exciting news about the project that David is bringing here to Los Angeles at the Aratani Theater. And I'm hoping many of you will be able to join us. You know, we also have been focused on sharing the meaning and relevance of the Nisei veteran story to audiences well beyond our pre-pandemic reach. For instance, last fall, we collaborated with the History Channel in creating a documentary, Hidden Heroes, the Nisei Soldiers of World War II, in which we were the producing consultants and also provided clips from our Hanashi oral history collection. In addition, we assisted in procuring four articles on their website, Japanese American World War II pages. Let's take a look at this clip. It's not just a great Japanese American story, it's a great American story. Witness the untold bravery of World War II's Nisei soldiers. Japanese men wanted to serve so badly. They're the most decorated unit in military history. And how they fought two battles. They were fighting the Nazis, but they were also fighting racism of our nation. They fought for the ideals of American democracy. Hidden Heroes, the Nisei soldiers of World War II, Thursday, November 11th at 8 on the History Channel. I have been seeing how we continue to get contacted by major corporations to share the legacy of the Nisei veterans to their globally based employees. In addition to last spring's Voices Magnified short form video with A&E Network, the Nisei soldier's story has been featured in January of this year in Takeout with Lisa Ling on HBO Max. And you were recently interviewed by Comcast newscasters and that was a great interview, Mitch. Each of these opportunities allows us to educate and inspire new audiences, many of whom did not know of the contributions of the Japanese American soldiers of World War II. You fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice and you won. Keep up that fight and we'll continue to win. The make this great republic stand for just what it const its constitution says it stands for the welfare of all the people, all the time. Another exciting update is one of our videos, I Feel With My Heart, about the story of Japanese Mexican-American 442nd veteran, Fernando Sosa Masuda. The film was selected at the 2022 LA Asian Pacific Film Festival. Instead of me describing the film, let's watch it. I liked Fernando from the moment I met him. He has a kind face and a sharp sense of humor. I would always ask him, Fernando, how are you feeling? To which he would always jokingly reply, I feel with my hands, mi amigo. Fernando is a sensitive man who tells his personal story with a tear in his eyes. The way they treated me, it was a little rough. His father, Yoneso Masuda, was a Japanese immigrant who somehow worked his way to Texas before the 1920s. His mother, Guadalupe Sosa, was Mexican and also in Texas. The two met, fell in love, 
and created a family. In the early 1920s, they moved to East Los Angeles. In the late 1920s, Fernando's father left the family to return to Japan. Fernando never saw his father again. In the 1930s, Lupe Sosa, as a single mother, raised her seven children. The lives of the Masuda kids were filled with the East LA culture. From riding on the streetcars to buying treats at the neighborhood store. The children were teased at school as their Spanish-speaking peers changed Masuda to Basura, the word for trash. Understandably, the children began going by Sosa. December 8, 1941, as the nation rose in fury and shock against the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt asked Congress to declare war on Japan. The Sosas, as all Americans, were affected by World War II. Fernando's two older brothers, Frankie and Al, enlisted in the Army and Navy. The Sosa children were some of the few ethnically Japanese individuals in the Los Angeles area who were not sent to an American concentration camp. In 1944, Fernando turned 19 and decided to register for the Army. Well, he went over there and they looked and said, well, hey, can you wear a Matsuda? He said, no, I'm not. Fernando didn't really know he was half Japanese. Everybody got mad at me, my mom. What did you do, what did you do? The Hollow Records, and they down there by the recruiting. They already had a tail on me. I mean, I didn't, put it this way, I didn't know, okay? But as time went by, I said, why do I feel somebody, you know, somebody looking up? And sure enough, like, they went around the neighborhood, talked to the drugstore store guy, the owner, talked to the barber shop, talked to the grocery store people. When I heard the Italian guy says, so, Japanese, I said, what are you talking about? What follows is a series of missteps and revelations that leads to Fernando being drafted in January 1945 and eventually assigned to the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, an all Japanese American segregated unit. By that time, the war was over. The 442nd Regimental Combat Team was stationed in Naples, Italy guarding captured German soldiers. The first weeks were not easy for Fernando, but Fernando loves to tell the story of how things began to change. And I was supposed to go to R&R, &R, and I had told the two brothers, Mas and Hideo, because they said, yeah, let's go, we'll go together. I said, I can't go. I said, I haven't got no bread. But when I came down, I went. Well, I walked up to my bunk. I see all this money. You guys are shooting crap. Dice. I said, say, hey, I said, somebody left the money on my bunk. Hey, did you leave money? The way they say, hey, only way. You leave something there. And the guy said, no, no, I don't know. I kept asking, I said, now come on, who, whose money is this? He says, nobody, that, no, it don't belong to me, it don't belong to me. It was at that moment, Fernando felt accepted. Fernando and his two buddies went to Switzerland and had the time of their lives. Fernando tells this story to everyone he meets. I once asked him whether he kept in touch with the brothers. His answer was no. They all came back stateside after the war. The brothers went to Seattle to raise strawberries. Fernando went back to Los Angeles to be with his family and eventually marry the love of his life, Lorenza Bonilla. This story meant so much to Fernando, so I decided it was time to see if we could reunite these young boys of World War II. Unfortunately, Moss and Hideo, they passed about 10 years ago. 
but they have children. And so I found out the name of one of their sons, and his name is uh, Mike uh, Trashta. And so I called Mike, and he lives up in Seattle by Bainbridge Island. And I told him the story, and he said he wants to meet you. Oh. So, so we're going to go to Seattle. Oh. You want to go? Sure. Whoa. So, we met at the airport on a Sunday morning at 5 a.m. Fernando, a 94-year-old, was as spry and eager as I had ever seen him. I asked him, how are you feeling? He answered, I feel with my hands. To which I responded, no, Fernando, today we feel with our hearts. He looked at me and simply smiled. As we boarded the airplane, I informed a flight attendant who Fernando was, a World War II member of the famed 442nd Regimental Combat Team going to Seattle to visit the son of a fellow veteran. I could only hope she would appreciate the significance of this journey. As we were taxiing down the runway, she made the announcement that a true American hero was on board, a member of the 442nd. Thank you so much for your service, for Fernando. Can we please give him a warm round of applause? Immediately, another female attendant came to shake Fernando's hand. Without missing a beat, Fernando said, Get out of my way, Mitch. The beautiful women are coming. We got our rental car and drove to the ferry, which would take us to Bainbridge Island. Planes, cars, and boats would all be involved in bridging the generations across the decades. The ferry ride to Bainbridge Island was uneventful other than the look of joy and anticipation which never left Fernando's face. As we drove off the ferry, we phoned Mike to say we were on our way. We had arranged to meet him at the Bainbridge Visitor Center. As we turned into the center, we saw a lone figure standing in the parking lot. I knew Fernando would be emotional, but I didn't expect what I saw when I reached him. Both Mike and Fernando were sobbing as they embraced one another. One man, so happy to touch a descendant of his past. The other man, eager to learn of a past of which he had never heard. We spent some time getting to know one another. Then Mike took us to the infamous bridge where the historic World War II photo had been taken. We spent an hour walking talking, sharing memories. We graciously thanked Mike for spending time with us. He immediately replied, you're not leaving yet, are you? I want you to come to my house and see all of my dad's scrapbooks. This moment was as important to him as it was to Fernando. We went to Mike's house. He had placed all of his father's scrapbooks and photos on the dining room table. We spent the next three hours poring over the photos. Fernando started rifling through the scrapbooks. The photos were mostly of the brothers and other soldiers. Then suddenly... Oh, and that's me here. Look at that hair. <laughs> How about them apples? Yeah. In that moment, I realized that Fernando had wondered if his precious memories of Hideo had been as meaningful to Hideo. We found the photos of a young, handsome Fernando, Fernando's dog, Lady, and photos that they had sent each other after the war. That's you, but who is she? Uh -oh. Fernando uttered, almost to himself, he kept those photos. What in the world are you doing in this picture? <laughs> we were just You're messing bad. around. There's a tub in the dress and whatever. I don't, I don't remember where we got this. <laughs> and then it, I'll be done. Just gonna take. It's supposed to be a joke when you send it home. Hey, look at it. Mike 
now in his early 60s, looked at the photos in amazement as he listened to the antics of his 20-year-old father. I've seen those photos countless times. I never knew it was my dad. He never shared those stories with me. I can't really explain to you how, how happy when I found about myself, who I was, and then these guys around me came around. I wouldn't change that life for anything. We finished looking at the photos. We had laughed, cried at times, and shared stories around the table. When the time came to leave, Fernando and Mike said a few words shook hands, and then hugged each other. In that moment, Hideo's presence was also in the room. The man whose heart Hideo had touched seven decades earlier, and the man whom Hideo had raised for over five decades, both celebrated his life with their embrace. Later that night over dinner, Fernando was deep in thought. I reached out gently touched his arm and asked, how are you feeling? He looked at me, smiled, and quietly said, I feel with my heart. It has been a busy year with virtual presentations made to the Lakeview, Oregon Rotary Chapter and the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, where our traveling exhibitions, Courage and Compassion, and Portraits of Courage are now on display. This past February, we presented in person to the St. Louis community at the St. Louis JACL Chapters Day of Remembrance and at Ladue High School. In Hawaii, our new high school curriculum is being piloted in public and private high schools throughout the island. And we are in the planning stages of an educator workshop for our next summer with our partners, the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii, the Matsunaga Peace Institute, and the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And we continue to work on new videos. Some of the topics of the upcoming videos will be the military intelligence service. My father was in the first class at Camp Savage, and he and his team were assigned immediately to the Pentagon. And the 65th Infantry Regiment, an all Puerto Rican segregated unit that served in both World Wars and the Korean War. They were treated unfair, they were treated with a lot of racism, um, they weren't treated as full soldiers and men. And today, I want to give you all a sneak peek at another video in production featuring the governor and first lady of Hawaii, who are both direct descendants of 100th Infantry veterans. Incidentally, the music soundtrack entitled Together in Stride was written and performed by award-winning musicians Daniel Ho and June Kuramoto. Let's check it out. Tell me about your father. Did you know that he was a veteran of World War II? He never at all talked about it. So, uh, you know, just another example of those who, uh, who went to war. He spoke about going to Italy and going to Africa, but nothing about the, the war, nothing about the details. What Hawaii is today, it's a result of the veterans of the 100th and 442nd. We never knew the, the depth of their service, and that is something that we've learned throughout the years. Obligation. Obligation. And about doing your part. That is so much about the core value of the 100th and 442nd veterans. You know, they were willing to volunteer and potentially sacrifice themselves. Stay tuned for the release of this video later this year. One of the biggest priorities 
is our outreach with the younger generations, or what we call the next gen. This is crucial because it will be the next gen who will care for and maintain the values and legacy of our Nisei veterans. Our torchbearers continue the spirit of our Nisei veterans with evergreen cleanups four times a year that include participation from several local colleges. In July, we will be traveling with some of our torchbearers to Denver, Colorado to meet with an intergenerational group of supporters. But you know, there's nothing like hearing it directly from the source. So here is what some of our torchbearers have to say. My great uncle receiving the Medal of Honor has really made me reflect on my Japanese heritage. What is it that I can do for the community that's even comparable to what these Nisei veterans did? 18, 19 years old, volunteering for service for a country that didn't trust them, imprisoned them, and they said, I'm gonna do my duty to my country. One of my sorority sisters had said to me, like, who do you think is more American? And she pointed to herself and then a friend next to her. It was like I was not American. At that moment, like I felt so liberated because I just let loose. I think I actually might be more American. Did your grandpa fight in the for the US ever? No? Well mine did. Being fourth generation or Yonsei is like I see myself more as American than Japanese. My uncle passed away. I found out in his obituary, you know, that uh, that that he had served. Um, sorry, give me one second. I found out in his obituary that um, he had served, and um, I I think that at that moment. I don't think I've. I don't think I've been more proud to say uh, that I'm, I was Japanese American. The legacy of the Nisei veterans is really fighting for the future of those they love, but also those that they would never know. The story doesn't change. I think the way that we tell it is going to change. Getting to know our young supporters has been inspiring. You can see the ways that they are not only deeply influenced by the veteran story, but also how closely they embrace that story. It's nice to have heroes that you can relate to. Much more than courage, bravery, and loyalty, it's the sense of duty. That duty to one's people, community, country, and oneself. By pursuing a career in diversity, equity, and inclusion, to continue to fight for injustices and continue to move the needle, I hope that I'm embodying the spirit of the Nisei veterans. I will never forget, and I will never let your stories be forgotten. Last year, at Monument Anniversary, I shared with all of you how a veteran confided in me that he felt confident that Go For Broke National Education Center would care for and preserve the legacy of our World War II Japanese American veterans. This year, I can tell you that not only will we continue to preserve the story, we are, more importantly, preparing the next generations to preserve the story. We visited Bruyers, and that's where the 442nd liberated that village from the Nazis. Lawson Sakai, who was the one veteran that was there, he was able to share the story and it made it just more real. So he was like my age when he went there, and I couldn't imagine having to do what he did. It will be our next gen who will be the storytellers. I participated in LA History Day. I did one on Japanese American incarceration. Obviously, it was very tra tragic when they got imprisoned but it was also very um, triumphant when they fought and helped win the war against Nazi Germany and changed American opinion about Japanese Americans. It will be our Yonsei and Gosei who will be the legacy keepers. You know, I have a great uncle who was in the 442nd. Two years ago, kind of reached out and started a dialogue. And from there, we've really kind of figured out 
ways that we can partner, ways that we can support this story, which is really important to me. And it will be young Americans of all backgrounds who will be the torchbearers. It's our turn, like we gotta raise up, we gotta represent, we gotta be like, yo, what's the point of learning history if we're not actually learning from it? I believe that we as a community and we as a nation need this more than ever. Service, sacrifice, obligation to others. These are the values that are being passed on. And we need your support in making this vision a reality. Together, we will make a difference. Please visit our website, goforbroke.org, and make a donation to help us to continue to tell our veteran story and prepare our next gen to tell that story. Thank you for being with us today. And you are so right, Mitch. Our work is needed now more than ever with thoughtful and purposeful programming, we can continue the important dialogue that will protect the freedoms the Nisei soldier fought for. We hope you enjoyed today's Monument Anniversary program and we thank all of our dedicated sponsors and supporters. Please stay connected to us on our social media channels, subscribe to our eTorch online newsletter and join our Go For Broke family. Don't forget that this program can be viewed again on our YouTube and Facebook platforms and remind your friends and family to watch, like, and share. On behalf of our leadership, staff, our Nisei veterans, and their families, we appreciate you spending time with us. And now a wonderful rendition of America the Beautiful by Kendall Yokoyama. Stay safe and be well. Proved in liberty.